morning, everybody. Good morning. Let me first and foremost invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Philippians. Been there the past couple weeks. We'll be continuing today um, in chapter 1, verses 18 through 26. Philippians 1, 18 through 26. It is good to be in the house of the Lord on the Lord's Day today. Today is the day that the church and Christians have gathered for the past 2,000 years to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord, and we continue that today. I'm especially feeling extra energetic and excited today after we got that extra hour of sleep last night. I hope you were blessed by that as well. I also had three cups of coffee, which is opposed to my normal two this morning, so I'm, I feel like I'm about to run through a brick wall, to say the least. Um, and on top, of all, on top of it all, we're all in one of my favorite passages in all the Bible this morning. Um, it's a great joy to be able to preach this and to share this with you. So let's now focus our attention to Philippians 1, 18 through 26. We'll be starting in the second part of verse 18. Paul writes, Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, This will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, you are good, and um, we know that because you are good, God, we, you say in your word, God, that when we ask for the Holy Spirit, God, you will not refuse us. And so, God, we come to you in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ, God. We don't come on, on any merit of our own righteousness, God, for we have none. We come to you only in the name of Christ, and we ask you that your Spirit would come upon us now in this moment, that um, you would be with the listeners, God, that you would help us to give us ears to hear your word, God, that for those who are believers in this room, God, that you would strengthen them and sanctify them and, and to build them up in the faith. And God, I, I pray also if there are any people who have not repented of their sins and trusted in you, God, if there are any non-believers in, the, in this room, God, that you would draw them to you for salvation, God, that you would open the eyes of their hearts, give them taste buds to see and to savor your glory, God. I pray that you would do these things, and I pray for myself also, God, that I would rightly um, interpret and divide and speak your word, God, that um, any words that I say would not be from me alone, but God, that they would be from you, God. We pray all this in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Believe it or not, we are coming up on the new year. Maybe you're not quite ready to think about that as we just got through Halloween and it's not even Thanksgiving or Christmas yet, but in just under two months, um, the new year will be rolling around. And with that, um, you know, that people will be making their New Year's resolutions and things they plan on doing better or newer things for the new year. Many of these come in the forms of, you know, going to the gym more, getting in better shape, saving more money, um, doing more things that will bring you happiness, spending, um, spending more time with your family, and, and so on. And um, these aren't by any means bad things to do, and they're great things, and I commend people who do them, but um, I can't help think of one of my theological heroes, and that's Jonathan Edwards, who when he was either 18 or 19 years old, he wrote, seven, he wrote 70 resolutions by which he would guide his life. And as an example, here's the very first resolution that Edwards wrote, which you could say guided and kind of framed all the others. This is resolution one from Jonathan Edwards. He says, resolved that I will do whatsoever I think to be most to God's glory and my good, profit and pleasure, and the whole of my duration, without any consideration of the time, whether now or never so so many myriads of ages hence. Resolve to do whatever I think to be my duty, and most for the good and the advantage of mankind in general. You could also include include Resolution 22 um, in in kind of summary. He says, Resolved 
to endeavor to obtain for myself as much happiness in the other world as I possibly can. He means heaven by that other world. With all the power, might, vigor, and vehemence, yea, violence I am capable of and can bring myself to exert in any way that can be thought of. In short, Edwards was dead set on honoring Christ in any and every way possible. I mean, it's crazy. Like, what 18-year-olds or any Christian gen- in general, for that matter, do you know who think like this at such a young age, who are so just set on honoring Christ? And I could go on about Edwards and his resolutions, um, but he's not the focus of today, although he is great. So turning our attention now to, to Paul and Philippians, we're going to see a similar resolution that's made by Paul in our passage, and a resolution that I fear that rarely, if ever, crosses the minds of, of Christians today. And the resolution is this that we're going to see Paul make. It's to honor Christ by any means possible, and as Paul will say, whether by life or by death. And so to do this, we're going to briefly look at Paul's expectation of future joy in um, the second part of verse 18, and then in verses 19 and 20, um, we're going to look at what Paul's resolution is in detail, and which is the ground, the reason for his future expectation of joy. Then in verse 21, We're going to see kind of the grounds and the reasoning for why this is Paul's resolution to honor Christ. And then in verses 22 through 26, um, we're going to see Paul's explanation and contemplation of his resolution. So to accomplish this, I want to really lay out for us um, Paul's reasoning and his argument in those verses. And I don't mean argument in like the bickering or the fighting sense, but argument is in like kind of like the rhetorical sense. Like I want to follow Paul's flow of thought and look at how and why he arrives at the conclusions that he does, and everything in between. So we're going to go verse by verse, and even sometimes word by word, um, and see how each piece of this puzzle fits together to make up Paul's resolution. You know, I think preaching is much, it's much more than just rightfully proclaiming the Word of God, and it certainly is that. I mean, without rightfully proclaiming the Word of God, it's not preaching. But I also think that preaching is, along with that, it's teaching people how to be good readers of the Bible, And that's what I want to do here is that, you know, the old saying, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a life. And so hopefully we can all learn together how to be better readers of the Bible by doing this. So with all that being said, let's look at Paul's future expectation of joy in verse 18. And just to refresh your memories, um, he says, yes, and I will rejoice. And so in the first part of verse 18, you see that, Paul rejoices in the proclamation of the gospel. He says, whether in pretense or in truth, in Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. And so that is something he currently rejoices in, that Christ is proclaimed in, in pretense or in truth. But in verse, the second part of verse 18, he shifts tenses. He says, yes, and I will rejoice. In other words, he's making a decision at the present time that in the future, whatever may come, he will continue Rejoicing, And so Paul expects that in the future he will continue, he will rejoice. And so what's the reason? Why will he continue to rejoice? And we see the reason for this in verses 19 through 20. And so you can see the reason why he will not stop rejoicing is because his future joy is tied to two things that Paul knows. The first of which we see in verse 19 and the second of which we see in verse 20. Before we get there, I want you to notice that the four, that little word for, at the beginning of verse 19. That four is a signpost that points us back, backwards to verse 18, as well as pointing us forward to verses 19 and 20. It kind of serves as the because to the why of verse 18. So why will Paul continue rejoicing in the future? Because, he says, I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. So that four is the key to understanding Paul's future expectation of joy. And so again, he says, for, he says, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. That's the first thing he knows, is that um, his imprisonment will turn out for his deliverance. And he says, As it is my eager expectation and hope, that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. And that was the second thing, that Christ will be honored. So the two, the two things that Paul knows that we're going to look at here is that he, this, this, his imprisonment will turn out for his deliverance. And the second thing that he knows 
is that Christ will be honored in his body, whether by life or by death. And there's things that qualify those statements, and we're going to look at those. But first, let's look at the first thing that Paul knows. We're going to look, we're going to look at that phrase, this will turn out for my deliverance. And so what does it Paul mean when he, when he says he'll be delivered? And so this phrase is actually identical to that of Job um, in Job thir- chapter 13, verses 15 and 16, when, um, when Job says, though he slay me, meaning God, though God slays me, I will hope in him. This will be my salvation. And so that phrase, this will be my salvation, is, is the same phrase that Paul uses here when he says, this will turn out for my deliverance. And so Paul saw his experience to that of Job. And we looked at, if you're here a couple of weeks, you, we, you know, we talked about Job. And so we know that Job was ultimately delivered physically from his suffering. You know, he lost everything, basically, but his own life, his, his children, his possessions, um, but he eventually was given all of that back and more by God. But we know that Job wasn't ultimately just delivered in terms of what he had physically. But we know that Job was also, like, he was, he was spiritually, ultimately spiritually delivered as well. We know that in all that he did, he never once cursed God. He never once turned away from his faith in God. And it wasn't, it wasn't just Job, you know, gritting, gritting his teeth and just powering it through to the end. That was a miracle of God sustaining Job so that Job would make it to the end. And so, likewise, Paul knew the story of Job. Paul, Paul knew his Old Testament well, and he knew that, um, he, that Paul knew that he would ultimately be delivered spiritually in the same sense that Job was. Um, it was a spiritual deliverance and vindication for, before God that God would hold, would hold him fast in his faith to the end, in his imprisonment. Paul didn't know whether or not he would be released from prison. He, you know, he was, remember, he was in prison for an, an indefinite amount of time. He didn't know whether he'd be released physically, but one thing he did know, that God would deliver him spiritually, that God would hold him fast to the end. And so we see how, how does this happen? How does Paul's deliverance happen? You see two ways that Paul's deliverance will happen. First, he says that through your prayers, he's talking to the people at the church in Philippi. He says that through your prayers, church at Philippi, this will turn out for my deliverance. And you can see just how important, you can see just how important prayer is in the life of Paul. If you remember, um, going back to the very beginning of Philippians in verses 3 through 11, Paul assures these people that he has been praying for them. Um, and here he tells them how much he counts on and depends on their prayers. Like, just think about that. He says that through their prayers, he, he knows he will be delivered in a spiritual sense. That's, that's a wild thing to think about. This is the way and in in like the, the power our prayers actually have. And there's a few other places that Paul writes where he um, shows just how important prayer is in his life. In 2 Corinthians 1.11, he writes to that church in Corinth. He says, You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. And then in Philemon, verse 22, he says, At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. And so this, in, this isn't just a one-off thing. This is something that Paul has very commonly spoken of, just how important he sees prayer as, and he really believes that prayer has power to do things. And I wonder for us, is, is prayer, specifically, specifically for that of our fellow brothers and sisters, is it, important, is it as important to us as it was to Paul? Uh, when we pray to God for ourselves and for others, do we really believe that our prayers are making a difference? Or do we think that they're just hitting a ceiling and God doesn't really hear us? Do we really believe that prayer does something? One way we can practically live this out um, is when someone asks you to pray for them is to do it. Uh, it, it sounds very simple, but it's, 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 it's incredibly practical. And it's so easy, you know, when someone asks you to pray for them or you're taking prayer requests like you do here in the services, which is an awesome thing. But how easy is it to go home and completely forget about that and to never once Ask God for that and, ask and pray for that person. It's so, I've done it so many times myself. When someone asks me to pray for them, I say, yeah, I'll pray for you, and, not, and, not, and just completely forget about it a few minutes later and never pray for them. But just think of what someone is asking you to do when they ask you to pray for them. They're asking you to go before the very throne of God in the name of Christ and ask God to do something for them. We should never take that lightly. We should always approach the throne of, like, we, not, we shouldn't approach God in a fearful, like, terrified way. Like, we should be, we should be fearful of God, and we should, we should have reverence before him and realize that he's God, and we're humans. But Hebrews tells us to approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in times of need. We should be bold because we have Christ, who has 
opened the way to us for God, and we should not take that lightly. Another practical way you can just use the power of prayer in your life is you can also take the initiative and go up, up to people and ask them how you can pray for them. I've never once known anybody who has been offended if you ask them how you can pray for them. Like People love that when you do that. It shows that you actually care for them personally and are willing to go to God on their behalf and ask God to do something for them. People will love that when you ask them, hey, how can I pray for you? And so that's another way I would encourage you to practically live that out. And so how does Paul, the first way that Paul knows that he will be delivered ultimately in the spiritual sense is that through the prayers of the people of the church in Philippi. Second, he says, um, another way he'll be delivered is with the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Of course, our prayers have no power on their own, and they require a special power to bring them for God and to give them and to make them effective. And that's the job of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that's why, you know, we, just as Paul did, we shouldn't see, you know, our prayers and the power of the Holy Spirit as two separate things working apart from one another. No, like these are two things that are working in tandem with one another. Our prayers coming in the Spirit, coming and giving them power and life before, before God. This is, this is what Paul affirms in Romans 8 when he says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray, as we ought, for, pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so, you know, additionally, the Spirit doesn't just help us to pray in the first place, but he's the one who gives, us, who gives our prayers power and legitimacy before God. And if it were not for the Holy Spirit, our prayers would be like hitting the ceiling, like we said a little bit ago. Our prayers would have no power apart from the Holy Spirit. It'd be like a rocket ship, but having no fuel. It would not, there'd be no point to it. We can try to make it go all we want, but it will never go anywhere unless we have the proper fuel. So we must be praying with the help of the Spirit, we must ask God, like, hey, I, when you pray, like, God, I don't know what to pray for as I ought. I know that even when I do pray, um, I need your Spirit to help me pray. So whenever you are praying for yourself, for others, ask God to send the Spirit to help you pray. And so Paul says that both of these things, the prayers of the church of the people of Philippi and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ are what will help turn out for his deliverance. So now let's turn to the second thing that Paul knows in verse 20, he says, As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. And so this is the second thing that Paul knows, and he grounds his future joy on, the fact that he knows that Christ will be honored in his body, whether by life or by death. And so we're going to walk through this um, phrase, or phrase by phrase. And so that those first three words there, as it is, um, we're going to come back to those here at the very end of this point because it will help tie everything together. So let's start off with where Paul says, my eager expectation and hope. He says, it is my eager expectation and hope. And so you could also translate um, this phrase, it is my hope-filled eager expectation. So just four words that keep building on one another, this hope-filled eager expectation. They just keep building on one another, one another just to show how consumed and, and just obsessed Paul is with this idea that Christ will be honored. And, and to make his case even stronger, just look at what he says next. Like He qualifies his eager expectation of hope with both a negative and a positive statement. The first is the negative. He says, it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed. And so this, this phrase, be ashamed, is, is often used in the Psalms to describe as one of my commentators said, he said, it's a humble, pious, who in his proper relationship of and trust to God, counts on God to not let them be disgraced, disappointed, disillusioned, or brought by him to judgment, and thus covered with shame before their enemies. And so Paul is so confident in God, and he is so confident in his relationship with God, that he knows that God will not let him be ultimately ashamed of the gospel. Like he says in Romans 1.16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. That's not, again, that's not Paul working on his own to make sure he's not shamed. That is the power of God at work in Paul's life, to make sure that Paul is not shamed. Second thing that Paul qualifies his eager expectation and hope with, he says, but that with full courage. So you have the negative, he won't be ashamed, and then you have the positive, but that with full courage. And so, in other words, Paul eagerly expects that he will not be lacking in any courage um, or boldness. He expects that he will have f the fullness of courage uh, 
think we see a similarity in similar idea in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, where Paul says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And so Paul knows that it is ultimately God who will supply his courage and boldness that he needs to honor Christ. And so next, Paul says, It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always. So remember for a second where Paul is as he's writing this letter. He's under house arrest, chained to guards who, for who knows how long, at least a couple of years at this time. But again, he doesn't know how long he's going to be here. But he's under house arrest, and he's unable to travel around preaching the gospel. He, you know, he still can preach the gospel. Um, we looked at that a couple of weeks ago. But he's not as mobile. He can't travel like he would like to be. But that doesn't stop Paul. He is determined, he is just as determined now as he ever was to proclaim the gospel while he's under house arrest. He's not letting his outward circumstances determine whether or not he's going to keep proclaiming the gospel. He is determined that now as always that Christ will be honored. And so I wonder, is, like, is it the same for us? Are we just as motivated to make much as Christ, of Christ when we're having bad days, when we have a bad day at work, when we have a bad day at home? When things don't go our way, are we just as motivated to honor Christ on those days? Or do we let those, when those bad days come, do we let that slow us down? And um, do we let that stunt our vigor and our, just our, our joy for, for the glory of God? So now as always, Christ will be honored. And so this is where we get to Paul's actual resolution. He's, he's, his eager expectation and hope that he will not be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. And so this is what Paul has really been getting at. This is his eager expectation and hope that Christ will be honored in his body. You could also say that he wants Christ to be magnified, to be exalted. And I love, I love an illustration that um, John Piper gives. He says when, when, when Paul says he wants Christ to be magnified, he's not saying it in the sense that, you know, you have, you have like a microscope to look at something tiny and then to make it bigger, like, you know, like little tiny bugs or bacteria. He's not saying you need to magnify Christ in that sense. When, we, when you say we want Christ to be magnified, it's like taking something that is so far off and big, like these planets and galaxies that are ex- so far away, but they're actually really big. It's like taking a telescope to that and, and zooming in so you can see just how great and how glorious it is. That's what we mean when we say we want Christ to be magnified, to be honored, and to be gloried. We are to exalt Christ and make him look great. And so that is Paul's eager expectation and hope that Christ will be honored. And how does he expect to do this? Two ways. First, he says, whether by life. So we'll be brief here because we're going to return to this idea later. But Paul expects that Christ will be honored in all of his living, not just you know, some parts of his life, not just these parts of his life, but Paul expects that Christ will be honored in all of his life. And everything that Paul does, he wants Christ to be honored and magnified. And as he writes in 1 Corinthians, he says, So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. And so we'll come back to that, this idea of honoring Christ in living. But um, Paul also expects that Christ will be honored in his body by his death. And so Paul doesn't just stop at his living. He is just as determined to make Christ look great in his dying as he is in his living. And so let's just think about this for a second. How exactly do you expect Christ to be made, made um, to be exalted in your, in your death? I think the answer is, is fairly simple. And I think that in both your living and your dying, as you're about to breathe your last, you don't look at death as a hindrance to you, as something that will take away everything you know and love and hold dear. You look at death as a gateway to, to being with Christ, and we'll look at that more later. And in short, you look at death as a gateway to the fullness of joy and the pleasures forevermore that are in Christ and that we will experience in him when we one day get to see him. And so that is how Christ is honored. That is how Christ is honored in your body by your death, is that you don't see death as a hindrance to you, as something that gets in your way, as something that's, you know, the last chapter in the book of your life. You see it as a gateway to a continuation of life eternal with Christ. And so returning to those three words at the beginning of verse 20, as it is. So many translations um, leave out this little phrase, and, and some others just skip right over it. 
And they just skipped right to Paul to when, when Paul said, it is my eager expectation and hope. But um, even this, these three words, as it is, what the ESV uses, that's the translation I'm using, um, it doesn't quite get at what Paul is trying to communicate when he says, um, or what he's trying to communicate here. And so translated literally, these words, as it is, the, as, the, as the NASB does, this phrase can say, um, this will turn out for my deliverance according to my eager expectation and hope. And so instead of as it is, a more literal translation is according to. And so this will turn out for my deliverance according to my eager expectation and hope. And so remember what we covered in, in verse 19, how Paul said that one of the things he knows is that um, there's a spiritual deliverance and, and vindication before God. And tie that together with this more literal translation of verse 20, and you have something like this. I know that my imprisonment will turn out for my deliverance according to my eager expectation and hope that Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. And so I wrestled with like these, these three words as it is for probably like 30 minutes. Because I'm like, okay, these words are in the Bible, so like they have to mean something. Like I'm not just gonna, I'm not just gonna skip over these words, you know, no matter how insignificant they may seem. And so I wrestled with these words as it is, or according to, for like 30 minutes, trying to think of, like, okay, why are these, what are these words trying to communicate? And then it just finally struck me. And so um, these, I think these words are, they're here to connect these two things that Paul knows, which we covered. The first thing, that he knows he will be delivered. And secondly, that Christ will be honored in his body, whether by life or by death. And they show us, the very essence of what it means to be a Christian. And that is this, that we will only ultimately be delivered from our own sin and from hell itself if we have the same eager expectation and hope that Paul had that Christ will be honored, whether by life or by death. And so deliverance happens according to or because of this, this, our desire to see Christ glorified in all things. And there's no other way to be delivered from our own sinfulness except to look to Christ alone and to see that he is magnified, to have a zeal for his glory and have a passion that his name may be known across all the earth. That is the only way that we will be saved is that Christ will be honored in our bodies. And so that's what Paul is saying when he says that um, he, will, he'll, he will be delivered according to his eager expectation and hope. And once I, once I read, once I read that, I was like, that, that blew my mind. Like, that just completely revolutionized the way I thought about this passage, that deliverance only comes if we regard Christ in this way, to see him honored in all things, whether by life or by death. And so, looking now to verse 21, we see the grounds of his resolution. Let's read this again, verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And so again, you see a four there at the very beginning of, of verse 21. And again, that serves as a signpost. It points backwards to verses 19 and 20, as well as forwards to what the rest of verse 21 says. The four, tell, the four tells us why it is that Paul is resolved to make Christ honor, to exalt Christ in, in his living and his dying. And then, so he says for, and then he says to me, tells us why it is that Paul, what Paul personally considers to be truly living and truly dying. And because we know that you know, Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit as he was writing these words, we know that this is also what God considers to be truly living and truly dying. And so he says, for to me, to live is Christ. You could also read this phrase in a few other ways. He said, you could also say to live means Christ. To live honors Christ. To live depends on Christ. And so however, however you want to look at this, you can clearly see that the focal point of Paul's life is none other than Christ himself. Everywhere that Paul goes, everything he thinks, everything he does, every, everything he does it is consumed with this honor or this idea to honor and glorify Christ in all that he does. And everything that Paul does is just permeated by this joy and rejoicing that is found in Christ alone. And to live, as, to live every second as Christ would have him live, and that is in, that is in perfect obedience and submission to God the Father, just as Christ did. So again, like this is the reason that Paul wants to honor Christ in his body, by his life. It's because for him to live as Christ. Paul wants to honor Christ because for him to live as Christ. There's no other life that is worth living. There's no other earthly gain that is worth anything to him other than that of Christ. Christ is the supreme joy that Paul finds in his living. 
he, then he says, for to me, to die is gain. And so Paul is resolved that Christ will be honored in his body by his death because he views death as gain, as getting a greater reward than if he were to remain on earth. But I have this feeling that some of us here today might be a bit reserved to, to believe this truth, that death is actually gain. I want to help you by the grace of God to really grasp and understand. And so I remember when I was a kid that um, there was a point where I was really afraid of death, not just of like the concept of it, but the... Um, but there, you know, just I thought, you know, there were so many things I thought death would hinder me from doing. I wanted to do a lot of things in my life. Like growing up, I wanted to be a baseball player, like any, like many young boys wanted to be. Um, sadly, I didn't turn out to be that great at it, though I did play for many years. But I had, the, I had so many things I wanted to do as a kid. And I'm like, you know, God, why did you have to make death a thing? It's just going to get in the way of all the things I want to accomplish. And I knew that, you know, growing up in church. Um, that Christians were supposed to believe that death was gain because we get to be with Jesus. I knew I was supposed to believe that, but in my heart, I didn't feel that. And there were times where I was so terrified of dying, even at such a young age, like, man, I don't want to do this. Um, and likewise, I feel that so many Christians today, especially us here in America, we know that we need to believe this verse, to die is gain, um, because it's in the Bible, Right? But it's either a very reluctant belief, or we just maybe we just choose to skip over it and just pretend it's not there. Maybe we instead think that man, you know, I have it, I have it pretty good here on earth. I have you know a decent job. I have a great family. You know, I have, don't have maybe don't have my dream car, but my car is pretty nice. I have you know, some pretty nice thing. I have I have good things going for me here on earth, and I just can't really see like how death can be better than this. Like it's pretty good here. Um, that's a tragedy. When people, when people, especially Christians, think that way. That people think that these temporary nice things here on earth are better than eternity with Christ because eventually everything we have here will pass away. But Christ will reign supreme forever. And so why should we view death as gain? What, what exactly is there to gain in death? And I think the answer is just one word, and it's God. You know, we don't want heaven merely to be free from pain, sadness, sickness, sin, and all these other th- terrible things that are brought about by sin. The elimination of those things are merely byproducts of being with God and being united with Him. And, and if you don't understand how God can be better than anything we have here, then, then first of all, I would, occur, I would just encourage you to, to repent of that thought. Just empty yourself of any thoughts that... Whatever you have here is better than God. We call that idolatry. When we think anything other than God, we treat anything other than God as God. Secondly, I would encourage you to fill yourself with the words of God about himself, to get in the Bible and to, and to truly to taste and see that the Lord is good. Get in, like, if you don't believe that death is truly gained, then just read your Bible, read your New Testament, see that all God is for you and, then all, and all that God has for you and this the joy that will bring you. So this, so this is like why I'm resolved with Paul in this passage and also what he says in Acts 20, 24. He says, I do not count my life as of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only that I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. In other words, God, if you, don't, if you see fit that I've fulfilled my ministry and my calling here on earth, like, take me up and don't hesitate. That's what Paul's saying, and that's what I would, like, I would say that too. And I would also say, like, like, do I have aspirations for the future, like me personally? Like, yeah, there's many things I'd love to do. I'd love, you know, I'd love to finish seminary. I'd love to find a wife, have some kids, settle down somewhere. You know, Lord willing, become the pastor of a church somewhere. You know, I'd, love, I'd love to travel the world and see the beauty of, of God's creation all around the world. There's many books I'd love to read, movies I'd like to see, books I would like to, books I would like to write myself. There are just so many things I'd love to do here on earth and accomplish, but I can tell you that not one of them compares with seeing the face of my Savior. Amen. I want that more than anything. Amen. I can't tell you how many times I've just envisioned and, and longed for this, the, the day when God finally calls me home for the first time, and I, I see the face of the one who bled and died for me the one who, who bore the wrath and the punishment for all the sins that I've ever committed. He took that upon himself and poured out his grace and his mercy for me. The one who had nails driven through his wrist and hung there and, and suffocated and as his back was ripped open, as he was beaten 
the one who took all of that for me, and the one who then rose again from the dead three days later. And I just can't wait to see him one day and just to wrap my arms around his neck and just to say thank you for all you've done. Or maybe I'll, just, I'll be so overcome and, and blown away by his majesty and his glory that I'll just fall down at his feet. Maybe I won't even be able to stand up to hug him. I don't know what it will be, but whatever my response will be, I can't wait for that day when he finally calls me home and I get to be at home with my Savior. I'd be willing to give up everything I have here. It, just, it would be no hesitation, just in an instant, just to be with Christ. I, I love my family, and it's always a joy to be with him, and I'm looking forward to being home with him for a few weeks in, for Thanksgiving. Um, but I would even be willing to forego the joys of being with them to see Christ. Because Jesus himself said, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And, if, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Worthy of me. I want to be counted worthy of Christ. I love him. I want to be with him more than anything, more than I want to be with my family, more than I want to finish seminary, more than I want to find a wife or have kids or have any careers. I want to be with him more than anything. And that's what Paul is saying when he says death is gain. I get to be with Christ, and that is better than anything I have here on earth. He is infinitely more concerned with seeing his Savior than gaining any treasure or any joy this world has to offer. And we would do well to think the same way. And so, now moving to verses 22 through 26, we see that the, um, the, Paul's explanation and contemplation of his resolution that Christ will be honored in his body, whether by life or by death. And so Paul gives benefits to both his living and his dying. He doesn't just say that there's, you know, he doesn't say that there's everything to gain by death and that, you know, there's no point in life. Like, life is just so full of sorrows that I would just rather go away because there's nothing to gain here on earth. That's not what Paul says. He says, if I am to live in the flesh, verse 22, that means fruitful labor for me. And so he has resolved that even if he is to remain in the flesh, he is to remain here on earth. He doesn't mean flesh is in like a sinful sense, like, you know, he does in other places like Romans 8. He doesn't mean flesh in that way. He just means remaining in the flesh is, you know, to live here on earth. Um, he says if he's to remain in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for him. And so let's, let's look at these two words, fruitful labor, um, starting with labor. And so he says if I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor. And so it's, what Paul's saying um, is here on earth for him. He says it's labor. It's going to be work. It's not just going to be him you know, sitting around watching Netflix, playing golf. It's not, not going to be Paul's life here on earth if he stays here on earth. It's, he's going to be busy. He's going to be, he's going to be working hard and exerting energy for the kingdom of God. As he says in Colossians 3.23, he says, Whatever you do, work heartily as from the Lord and not from men. And it's not just labor. It's, he says it's going to be fruitful labor. It's not, going to be, it's not going to be just him working, but nothing will come of it. There's going to be, it's not that there's going to be no results. He's, he's, not going to be spending, he's not going to be spending his time working on things that he knows won't yield fruit either. He's going to give his time to things he knows that will produce fruit and, and joy for the kingdom. He is in, he, his endeavor is to make the gospel known in both word and for deed, and he knows that that's the only thing that ultimately matters, is that lives are transformed by the gospel and people are sanctified and unbelievers are brought from death to life. That is what he's, that's what he's focused on. And I just wonder, like, do you see the purpose of your life as, as fruitful labor for Christ? Are we content to just kind of coast along and hope that things turn out okay? Or are we really digging in and really exerting energy and searching, for, searching out this fruitful labor for the kingdom? And so if you were to summarize Paul's ambition in his living, in his living you can take all the statements that Paul says about his life and, can, and kind of combine them into one. It, it would kind of sound something like this. He would say, you know, as it, as it is my eager expectation and hope, that Christ will be honored in my body by life for to me to live as Christ because that means fruitful labor to me. And so you can kind of see how all that fits together. You take all the statements that Paul has about his living and you kind of condense them into one phrase and you can see what Paul's ambition is in his living. But Paul doesn't just stop there. Look at what he says next. He says, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. He's talking about this life and death. And he says that he actually wrestles with these thoughts of life and death. And, you know, Paul knows that, you know, he doesn't actually have the power to decide whether he's going to live or die. Again, Paul knew his Old Testament well, and he would have known 
verses like Deuteronomy 32, 39, where God says, See now that I, even I am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. And also 1 Samuel 2, 6, the Lord kills and the Lord brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and he rises and he raises up. There's just a few verses that show that life and death are ultimately in the hands of God. We don't decide when we live or when we die. It is God is the ultimate determining factor. And as long as we're on earth, we should see that as God telling us that he still has us on mission to, to spread his glory. Additionally, you know, Paul, didn't, Paul wasn't trying to make up his mind on whether he wants to live or die so that, he can go, so that he could then go to God and ask him, like, hey, can I live? Or, hey, can I die now? But Paul is just really, um, he's asking himself, he's just asking himself a rhetorical question here, and he's asking his readers to follow along with him. It's just this kind of a mental exercise that Paul is doing for himself. So he doesn't actually think that he has the power over life and death. He isn't trying to make up his mind so that he can then go to God to ask. It's just a rhetorical question that Paul is asking in his mind. But the question still remains, why is, so, why is Paul so hard-pressed? Why is he... Why, why does he say, I can't tell? I can't, choo- I can't tell which I shall choose between these two. Um, it's because there are, there are immense joys and benefits to both living and to dying. Again, Paul doesn't, doesn't say, I'd rather just die because there's nothing to gain from me here. No, he, Paul recognized that there is great joy. There is fruitful labor for him to do here on earth. You know, the joys of seeing new believers come into Christ, the joys of seeing new churches planted, the joys of seeing believers built up. The joys of seeing of training new pastors and missionaries; those were all great benefits. That Paul's like, man, like that really, like, I don't know what to do with this. Like, dying, I get to be with Christ, but here, I get to see the joys of people coming to know Christ better. Um, so Paul just wants to be. Um, so there are just immense joys and benefits to Paul being obedient to Christ here on earth. But what is what are the benefits that? Are, that um, better to death that would that would rival these benefits of living because he says he's hard pressed between the two. So we have these joys of living, and these joys of dying. And we've already kind of touched on the joys of dying, but we're going to dig a little deeper into this. And so um, Paul says next, he says, "My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better." And so Paul has these two options and these kind of um, these desires that are bouncing around it in his head: to be with Christ in his dying, or to serve Christ in his living. I mean, what love for the Lord this man have, has, must have had. If these are the two issues that he's wrestling with. Like, we have issues at work, issues at home, like all kinds of issues bouncing around in their heads. But these are the issues that Paul is concerned with. Like, what love he must have had like, to be, like, this is, what, this is the kind of stuff that Paul thinks of. Like, do I want to live and continue serving the Lord, or, do I wanna, or should I die and, like, be with the Lord? And Paul, Paul is just so focused on Christ that everything he thinks, everything that passes through his mind is Christ-centered. But just notice what he says. He says, my desire is to be with Christ. In other words, this is Paul's ideal outcome for himself. He says that he wants to depart and be with Christ. And so, and, you know, depart is just a euphemistic way of saying to die. Um, Paul knows, but Paul knows that on the other side of death, he will get to be with his Savior. That's why he says, um, you know, he doesn't say my desire is to depart and go to heaven, though he could have said that and he would have been right in saying that. But he says... My desire is to depart and be with Christ. And that's why, that's why he's so focused on. And I would just say to us today, like, if we want to go to heaven, but we don't really care whether or not Jesus is there, we don't want to go to heaven. We, we, it's, it's, it's a utopia of our own imagination that we're just thinking of if we want heaven, but don't care whether or not Christ is there. Like Christ, he's the key gain of heaven that we'll see when we, that we'll experience and enjoy in when we get there. I think one of the great tragedies of of the American church is that heaven is not talked about from the pulpit or just in general more often. Oftentimes, all we'll just get is a a vague reference to the place, but anything of actual substance about what it'll be like is rarely ever talked about. And when it is, I often think it's it's incorrect. So here I just want to give us a small little theology of, of heaven. And so when Paul says he wants to depart and be with Christ, he's not desiring death in the way that the ancient Greeks would have thought. The Greeks, particularly the philosopher Plato, um, believed that everything that was physical was bad and everything that was spiritual is good. And this has become to be known as Platonism or dualism. Because you have these dual, dual 
worlds as it is, kind of competing against one another and can't really coexist with, coexist with one another. And as it relates to humans, this philosophy would say that our bodies, our physical bodies, are just shells that hold our souls in them and that when we die, our soul is finally released from anything physical and we're just going to be floating around in the clouds just doing nothing after we die. And I fear this, this idea has crept into many Christian circles so that we believe that when we die, yes, we'll be in heaven, but it won't be like material. It won't be physical. We'll just be kind of floating up in the clouds, playing harps, singing songs for the rest of eternity, and it won't, there won't really be any point to us being there. And author Randy Al- Alcorn, in, in his book, Heaven, he calls this, he calls this idea Christo-Platonism, Christo for Christ and then Platonism. And he's very much against it, as I am also. He believes, as I do, that contrary to Greek philosophy, just because something is bad, or just because something is physical, it doesn't mean it is bad. Like, just remember the very first chapter of the Bible in Genesis 1, when God, after each day when God was creating the world, what did he say? It was good. And when he created humans, what did he say then? And it was very good. So just because something is physical, it doesn't mean that it is bad. It is sin, our own sinfulness that, that turns things bad and ruins things. Brothers and sisters, our bodies are an essential part of what it means to be human. To be human. If we don't have bodies, then what are we? We're not human. Um, part of having a body is what it means to be human. I want to take us over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And if, you, if you can, turn there, because I, wa- I want you to see this for yourself. To 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to look at this a little more in depth. I just want to spend some time on this so we really understand why death is gain. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 9. Paul writes that, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we were still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this, this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that we are, while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, We are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. And so notice just a few things from this passage. Notice in verse 1 that Paul refers to our current bodies as a tent. Um, But that when we die, he says we have a building from God. In other words, our heavenly dwelling will be so much more glorious than the tent, this body, that we have now. And and then in verse 4, he says that we groan, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. In other words, we don't, we shouldn't long to depart with Christ because that means we'll be without a body. That's what he says, you know, we don't um, long to die because we'll be without a body because that will be, we will be further clothed when we die. And I don't know exactly what that means when he says we'll be further clothed, but all I know is that like, I want that. I want to be more clothed than I am right now. Like That's going to be glorious. And then notice in, in verse 8 when he says we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. He isn't saying that when we get to heaven we'll be without a body. When he says we would rather be away from the body and with the Lord, he's just saying we won't have this body. This body that we have now will not suffice to see the things we will see there and hear the things we will hear there and experience the things we will experience there. We must be glorified, and, and um, we are far too low. Our bodies are far too lowly now for all of those things that we will see and experience when we get there. And God has promised that he will do that for us, that he will glorify us um, when we get there. And, so, you know, we should be clear that um, all, of, all this is what we've been referring to here is, is what we would call the intermediate or the present heaven. In other words, the heaven that exists now is, is not the final state of believers because even there, we still await the second coming of the Christ. Well, heaven and earth will be, will be made new. We'll have the new heaven and the new earth and, the, and everything will be joined together in perfect harmony and our bodies will be fully resurrected. And so, yes, there's a heaven right now, and it'll be more glorious than what we have here on earth now. 
But even then, we await the second coming of Christ, where he will make all things new. And so, this is also what Paul refers to in, in Philippians 3, um, verses 20 and 21. So it's important that we don't mix up this, this intermediate heaven and the new heaven and new earth that will come when Christ returns. And, you know, again, both are glorious, more glorious than what we have on earth, but the new heaven and new earth is the consummation of it all. And so all of this, and we can't just go on for so much longer about this, um, is why Paul says that he would rather depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. And so, um, to summarize Paul's ambition in his dying, kind of like we did with his living, we can take all the statements about his death and, and kind of combine them into one. It would be like this. As he says, As it is my eager expectation and hope that Christ will be honored in my body by death, for to me, to die is gain, for that is far better. And so Paul, again, he would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. But then notice um, what he says next, and we're back in Philippians now. He says, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. And so Paul knew that his time of departure, it was not time for him to part. His, he knew his departure had not yet come. And that God still had work for him to do here on earth. You know, later in his ministry, in the very last letter he wrote in, in 2 Timothy, um, he wrote to Timothy that, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and my time of departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So he says that in Timothy, which is the last letter, or second, or second Timothy, which is the last letter that he ever writes. But here in Philippians, he knows that there is still work that needs to be done. And he's not going to run away from it. He's like, no, God, I'd rather not do this, so I'm just going to kind of step back here and um, not do that. But no, Paul loved these people so much that he was overjoyed to help them grow deeper in Christ. And, you know, we truly get to see the, the heart of Paul here. You know, we often, you know, we can often think of Paul as just a stone-faced guy who wrote about these big theological topics of sin and election and justification, but never really felt anything. But the book of Philippians flies completely in the face of that Paul never felt anything, that Paul actually did have emotions. He felt things. He has the heart of Christ here, and he cares for those who maybe aren't as strong as he is, and he's willing to come alongside them and help build them up and strengthen them. And I want to turn this inward to us. You know, how often are we willing to forego our own comforts and our own um, whatever we may want to do for ourselves so that we can help others grow in Christ? Maybe the desires and things that we want for ourselves aren't bad things, but are we willing to forego those good things for ourselves so we can help others to grow in Christ, to come alongside them, like to read the Bible with them, to pray for them? Um, are we willing to take time out of race to intentionally love those who are around us? So next thing that Paul says, um, verse 25, he says, Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. And so Paul has finally resolved this rhetorical question that's been bouncing, bouncing around in his mind. And he says that he will continue to walk alongside these people so that they can be strengthened and have progress and joy in the faith. And Paul knew that um, there was still work that needed to be done in these people. Right? Remember what he wrote in, in verse 6 in, here in Philippians 1. He says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is confident that God, God began a good work in these people and that because it is God who started this good work, that he will not leave it unfinished. He will make sure that it happens. But that does not give Paul or these people an excuse to just kind of sit back and kind of coast. Paul knows that there is actual work that needs to be, to be done on their part if they're to make it to the end. Like he writes in verses, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, he says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So there's, work on, there's work on God's part because he will make sure that all those who are truly saved will make it to the end. But there's also work that needs to be done on our part as Christians to, to walk in holiness, to, to be in the Word daily, to be in prayer daily, to be in community with one another, to do those things. And so if you'd stop reading after going through verse 24, you would have thought that death would soon be upon Paul because that's what he was resolved to do. And that's what he saw as far better than life, and he thereby desired that. But if you kept reading here through verses 25 and soon verse 26, you'll find out that Paul actually becomes convinced that living is actually better than dying at least for the time being. 
So what's going on here? At one point, you have Paul thinking one thing, and the next thing you know, he's kind of switched courses and be like, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm over here now. Um, I think that what happened is that Paul ultimately came to the conclusion that he did because he saw obedience to Christ and Christ's will as bringing more joy to him than what he thought was better than himself. He would rather obey Christ and be and, and, obey, and obey Christ's will than do what he thought was best for himself. He was willing to trust Christ, to trust God with that. He 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 saw that it would bring it bring him more happiness and joy, and then what seemed apparent and better for himself. And you know, just like we saw a few weeks ago, that Paul saw his imprisonment as for Christ, and that was his motivation in in preaching the gospel. So here, Paul sees his own will and his own desire as captive to that of Christ. He sees his whole living and his whole dying as for Christ, and whatever he does, he trusts Christ that. Christ will bring him the joy that he needs to be motivated in his preaching and sharing of the gospel. And this is why he says what he says next. In the last verse, he says, So that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. So Paul isn't saying here that the focus of the Philippians' praise should be on him. He isn't saying that the Philippians church at Philippi should praise him for what he's doing. He's saying that in me... You may have ample cause to glory in Christ. He's saying, if you think I'm great, just look at Christ. He is far more great. He is far more superior. Paul knew better than anyone that um, Christ is the one who sustains him, the one who empowers him in his ministry. And ultimately, everything, Paul, everything that Paul had and, every, and everything that Paul was was found in Christ. It is him who supplies and directs him in his ministry. And this would become more evident when Paul was able to come to them again. So one last thing I want to hit on here is this word glory, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus. This word here, glory, here, it's a, it's a really strong word. It carries the idea of boasting, right? So um, this is not the only time that Paul talks about boasting in Christ. He says in Galatians 6.14, he says, But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2, he says, for I decided to know nothing among you except the Lord, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then here in Philippians in chapter 3, verse 8, he says, Indeed, I count everything as lost for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, so that everything Paul does, whether in his living, in his dying, in his coming and going to the church at Philippi, in his serving to them, it is all for the glory and praise of Christ. So in closing, I reference Jonathan Edwards and his resolutions at the very beginning um, in this sermon, I think it would be fitting to, to close with another one of his resolutions. His ninth resolution is as follows. Resolved to think much on all occasions of my own dying and of the common circumstances which attend death. So just again, think of Edwards, 18 or 19 years old, and this is what he's resolved to do, to think of his own dying. I think it would be, I think that we, like Edwards, would do well to think of our own death. Not in like the morbid, scary sense, as, but to think of death as it pertains to being with Christ, to being with heaven, to, to, or not with heaven, in heaven and with Christ, to be with him, to experience the fullness of joy, his undomesticated, his unbridled glory and majesty. That's how we should think of death as, as the entryway to experiencing that. And not, it's not something you should think about like all day, every day, but just like occasionally. Like this is the thing I try to do for myself, maybe just like a couple couple of days a week for a few minutes, just like, yeah, just think like, yeah, I, I'm going to die one day. That is a reality. I'm not going to like try to push that off. It is a reality. I'm either going to die or Christ is going to return um, before that happens. But most, most likely, I'm, I'm probably going to die before that happens. And just like to, th- to take, some time, take a few minutes and just think about that and let that be your motivation and, um, for in Christ here on earth. And I think if we do that, it'll revolutionize the way we live here on earth, that we think about what we're ultimately going to see and do and experience. We'll be all the more diligent to confirm our calling and election, as Peter writes. And when we let the love of Christ control us, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, so therefore, let us look to what is unseen. That in Paul's, you know, when we read that passage in 2 Corinthians, Paul says we walk by faith and not by sight. Though one day our faith will be turned to sight, but for now we must look at what we can't see by faith. Trust that that reward of being with Christ is stored up for us in heaven, and that is, it is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It's not going to go away. We just have to get there.
So let's pray and encourage one another to make it to the end and trust that Christ, that he will hold us fast to the end, that it's not ultimately up to us, but that he will do it and that he will himself be our treasure and our prize when we finally arrive. Let's pray. Father, we, we, we just thank you so much for this passage, and we pray with Paul that um, we are resolved with Paul that Christ will be honored whether by life or by death. God, we view, um, we view our lives. We pray that you would help us to, um, to see our lives as working for the fruitful labor that, is, that accompanies doing um, work for your kingdom. And we also pray that you would help us to think of death as gain and that it pertains to being with you, Jesus, where we will be with you and worship you for all eternity. We pray all these things in the name of, of Christ and by the power of the Spirit. Amen.